In your feet, if you will. We're going to sing 386 in your books, number 386, The Comforter Has Come. Appreciate that, and he has come right in our hearts, amen? Well, good deal. Well, let's look at our memory verse. I think we have this coming up. Let's read that together, brand new for the month, and it's Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13, again, keeping with our theme of uh, uh, living by faith this year. Good verse, good verse. Well, let me pray, and then I'll let you be seated. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We're grateful for the good day, the good morning. Father, the blessings that we have all around, we are uh, truly indebted to you. We owe ourselves back to you, and Lord, may we serve you with a cheerful heart. And we'll give you the praise in it all. And Lord, bless our, our time tonight in the scriptures. Lord, encourage us in the way, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, the Lord decided to take Jim Kimball home whilst I was preaching this morning. And so we got the word about 1030 our time. Uh, uh, Grandpa Jim uh, was taken and ushered to heaven around 9.25 their time, uh, just in a sweet, a sweet time, and uh, got a chance to visit on the phone today with uh, Mom uh, Kimball, and she says thank you for prayers, thank you for prayers for over the last few years especially, and um, 
she's going to be fine, she says. And uh, so we, we appreciate that. And uh, he'll probably be in, be buried this week, probably Thursday or Friday. She'll get more news of that on Monday. And uh, so we'll see what we can uh, ourselves, what we can do in that regard um, over the next uh, weeks or so just to be a help. I believe that she initially is going to be going to live in uh, Wis uh, Wisconsin. Who would go to Wisconsin unless you're living there already, all right? I've been there, beautiful state, but it's sure cold right now. Yeah. Just saying. Uh, um, Wilmington, yes, Wilmington. Slight difference from Wilmington and Wisconsin, all right? So uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. So that's about seven hours or so from us, depending on who's driving and what car. Um, so um, that would be good. Uh, and, and the oldest son, Rick, w which would have been Lori's or, or next down brother, uh, will uh, kind of take charge uh, to help in that regard. So we want to, and I appreciate your prayers for that as well. And um, I just wanted to make mention, uh, when we first met him 15 years ago, uh, 14 years ago, um, we knew they had just gotten married. We were going to do a ceremonial, ceremonial wedding for them. They went and had the uh, a preacher just get them, you know, uh, got the old Indian wedding done. You know, you want them, you want them, you got them, amen, you know. And that's, that's what they did. He, he had to get a surgery done and just wanted to be respectful of having a woman in his house to take care of him. So he said, we ought to get married. So that's what they did. And so we came along in the next month uh, in April. We, we celebrated and had a formal wedding for them. Uh, with, uh, anyway, it's good. But when we, fir when we first met him, we drove up into the, in the bus at the time into their parking lot of the church. And there st he stood out in front to meet us and greet us with mom. And there he was with a hat on and long hair. You know, and we thought, you know, I don't remember Jim Kimball looking like that last time I saw him, like 20 years ago. And here he is pastoring this church and all. He's, and then there he is holding the Bible and has NIV on it. And I'm telling you, my dear wife that has gone to heaven, like they greeted today after all these years. Isn't that something? Uh, she came unglued. She was ready to take mom, put her in the bus, and leave that guy. <laughs> but it was tense for a little while. But then he pulled off his hat, you know, and then he turned his Bible, and, you know, he, he told, he says, Now, Lori, I'm just as King James as your daddy was. I'm just as local church as your daddy was. And I'm just, you know, went on and on. And that's fake hair, just saying, you know. And as we can see, his beautiful bald hair then, bald head. So anyway, it was, but he was, a, he was definitely a, a, a card. You know, just a, a hoop and a holler, and he certainly was a counterfeit dollar, right? But uh, it's, it's an amazing thing that God has done in him in all those years, and I'm so glad I got to get his library last year and got to visit with him and talk with him, and God knew the timing in that and all. So uh, anyway, all that being said, all that mushy-mushy stuff, but just, again, pray, if you would, think of uh, Ruby, Ruby Kimball, and um, uh, it would be a blessing to our family for sure. Let me uh, read a, mem uh, a memory verse. Now, we already did that, Mike. Um, Brother Morales is our missionary to Baltimore. And uh, I just appreciate him. I'm going to read this to us here tonight. And, uh, and I hope you get a blessing out of it, as I have. I've got a special affinity for church plants, but nonetheless, that's just me. Um, the uh, Morales report here on Sunday, February 4th, our church traveled to White Post, Virginia, to be with Pastor Kyle Sheely and Liberty Baptist Church. Now, how you leave on a Sunday with your church, I, I'm not asking those questions. Um, Pastor Sheely asked Pedro to come and preach during their evening service, that's what it was in the afternoon, um, and to give a report of the work being done in Baltimore in person. So we took a group of 10 folks from our church and drove there in our church shuttle. We had a great time of fellowship, and it was so awesome for Liberty to see their missions dollars at work. It was also great for our church also to meet one of the congregations that supports us. It was an all-around good time. Many of you know that we celebrate our anniversary on Christmas Day. Uh, it was difficult, or it is difficult to truly enjoy it during that season, so we usually have uh, to be creative. We decided to go on our uh, first ever cruise for our 30th anniversary. We took the trip 
in February. We left after the morning service on Sunday the 11th. Uh, although the first couple of days at sea were pretty rough, we were able to enjoy the vacation. We thank the Lord that it, that, um, that it, yeah, we made it home for services the following Sunday. There we go. The, la the ladies of our church started a new fellowship ministry called Coffee Break. They get together at a local coffee shop to talk, play games, and of course, drink coffee and fellowship. This, the, the first meeting went really well. There's pictures here of it. The ladies that attended had a wonderful time. There's probably about 10 ladies there. Uh, the last week of February, a group of 10 dedicated Christians from Heritage Baptist Church in Willoughby, Ohio. Does that make any sense to us? We, we support uh, Brother Suglio in Willoughby, Ohio. So 10 from that group uh, came to help us evangelize. Pastor Frank Suglio and his wife, Rebecca, led their church to do a missionary trip to Baltimore. We knocked on doors and distributed gospel literature for three days. Nine precious souls trusted Christ as their Savior. Glory to God. The Suglio family is one of those missionaries that we support. It was so good to partner with them in spreading the good news. We even had a first-time visitor, Jolie Beckett, from the previous Sunday uh, join us. Wow, this is incredible. On Sunday the 25th, we had one of the sweetest church, service we, church services we've ever been a part of. Pedro's second oldest sister, Vivian, got saved that day. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. We've been uh, praying for her for, for years and are so thankful that the Lord had answered that prayer. Pray for Vivian to, continually, uh, to continue faithfully on her walk with the Lord. The last week before uh, last Sunday of the month, Pedro received a text message from a Hispanic man asking if we offered Spanish Bible studies. They heard him give a short one-minute devotion on the local Christian radio station. Pedro initially told him no, but, but Trina suggested that we offer to do our Thursday night Bible study in Spanish for those men. Of course, Pedro speaks Spanish. All four of them attended on, on, the, on the 29th. Pray for us to have wisdom moving forward regarding the new development. <laughs> a new development for Spanish people wanting, wanting to hear from the Lord. Amen. And uh, so that's a blessing. Please continue to pray um, uh, for a piano player and song leader, uh, a building acquisition, a salvation of souls, discipleship, and Vivian to be baptized. If your church would be interested in doing a mission trip to Baltimore, please let us know. We would be honored to have you. We thank God for you. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, Pedro and Tina, or Trina, sorry. So praise the Lord. We'll pray for the Morales family. And, uh, you know, it just dawned on me, if it rains on Tuesday and it's a difficult for us to take our group to the Strawberry Festival, I think we'll just head north to Baltimore for a missions trip. Is that all right? <laughs> yeah. Amen. All right. Uh, anyway, so nonetheless, we're still going to go. We're planning on it on, on Tuesday, 9 o'clock. Amen. Uh, let's see. Let's have a prayer here for Brother Pedro and uh, his work there. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again tonight. Our church family uh, just uh, are, are thrilled uh, to give, to give to missions. And this, again, is a picture of reward, picture of blessing uh, with the investments that we have had over the years and and Lord, we are thankful to be a part of God's economy. And Lord, we're thankful to hear such good things. Uh, the salvation of souls, certainly. The uh, adding to the church. Lord, the prayer request for a new building. Uh, Lord, um, uh, Vivian being saved. What a, what a blessing that is. I pray it help her to walk with the Lord and, and uh, follow in baptism. Uh, God, we, we pray for this dear church. Also for the church in Willoughby. We're thankful for... Um, Brother Suglio as well, and so it's a blessing to hear these getting together, and so Lord, please uh, have your hand upon these works. We know that you're all involved, you're in it, you're blessing, and we are thrilled to be a part of that blessing. I pray you protect and keep the preachers, Lord, I bless their families, or bless the leadership of those churches. God, I pray that you'd please just intervene uh, good things on, on their behalf, for the sake of Christ and souls, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, Brother Josh, would you come?
All right, 342, Rock of Ages. song tonight is Oh How I Love Jesus, yeah. number 92 in your books there. comes from we love him <laughs> you got it amen because he first loved us thank God for that love <laughs> we think wow what love that was to love someone like me right love someone like you well we thank God for it amen please take your Bible and if you'll join me there in Acts chapter number 20 we had the first portion of the message this morning, and we'll look here at the second half, second portion, I don't know if it's half, <clears throat> but it's the meeting at Melita. And this morning was Paul's example to the Ephesian leaders. He bore his heart, and he uh, just encouraged them, gave them some things to be committed to, and uh, so we thank the Lord for that commitment that he had, the example to those leaders to go back and to be just as committed. Same thing for us, uh, for us to be committed uh, to the causes, amen, and to these particular points that were uh, brought up here in the message. And as it comes to a point in the, in the text, verse number 28, it kind of changes tone, changes tune just a little bit. And uh, 
at least as I divided it to, to look at it in my heart, um, it, it moves on to more of an exhortation to these men. Uh, first being committed, and uh, you know, it, it really doesn't make sense to exhort people to go back and do the work if you know they're not committed to some things, <laughs> right? So it is good that we see how he had pl played out this meeting together as he constructed of the, of the Lord to be able to work with these leaders and uh, to send them on their way. But this second half is truly the thought of, of his exhortation. Um, where he's exhorting, he's encouraging these people in such a way, and we'll, we'll get to that as well. Um, so look with me to Acts 20 and then verse number 28. Acts 20 and verse 28. Um, exhortation is, if you were to define that, uh, it's conveying urgent advice. Conveying urgent advice or recommendations. And if you see how this was done, you see it was an urgent thing. It was an important thing, and it was something that he was trying to convey to them, certainly. And he did it in a way of passion, uh, of love, um, and it was his recommendations there for them. So, hence I use that word exhortation for them. Um, and also, what was in his mind, and what was coming to the mind of those men, was this was going to be the last time that he would see them on earth. And uh, that's, that's an that's a eerie feeling. Um, maybe you can think back to some times where you knew a certain engagement talk, whether it was on the phone, in person, uh, to know this would be your last time ever saying something before heaven would claim somebody home. Or uh, uh, even in many bad situations, you never know uh, what could come of things, uh, that it could be that last conversation. So your mind can be filled with some of those things. Sometimes it's the, it's the last words, the last words that someone said, and uh, they can be cherished. Maybe you can think to some folks as their last words of recommendation or just their last words on life saying, I love you. Um, boy, I, I've got some of those as well. I won't take the time to share, but I, I certainly know and I cherish some of those last words given me uh, before uh, I would never hear that voice or see that person again. Um, <clears throat> so maybe you can put your feet uh, in the feet of Paul here. As he's on his voyage, he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be then, as we said earlier, to see and be before these, these groups of people and men to ultimately die in Rome. And he would see them one last time. But uh, what was on his mind was the good of the church. What was on his mind was the edification of these men to continue on what he started three years ago, or, or for three years of time that he had spent there. And so um, we'll move into verse number 28, if you will. There's, there's some, you might look at your notes if you got it, uh, you see blank and then time. So we're not going to take a lot of time, but there's some time we're going to deal with, uh, with these little thoughts this, uh, this evening, and you'll probably learn it pretty quickly as we go through it. Um, but verse number 28, please join me there. It says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That is the verse. Heeding, heeding time, I guess, if you want to fill in the, the, that word. It's what time is it? Well, it's heeding time in our notes regarding the exhortation. Heeding time, take note would be the thought. It would be give careful attention to when it says heed this, take heed. And there's a number of scriptures in, uh, there in the Bible there that speaks of that very same verbiage. Colossians 4.17, uh, Paul there is writing to the church at Coloss. And he says, uh, and say to Archippus there in the latter part of that chapter, latter part of the book, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Take heed. Uh, pay attention to the duty given you. Um, I've got some other thoughts regarding here from a, another, uh, another uh, brother, I guess we would say. Uh, take heed, therefore, attend to, be on your guard against 
the dangers which beset you. This is how he was leading into this, into this portion of, of his exhortation. There was a purpose for he to say, take heed, to pay close attention, to be on guard. Um, and he says it there not only that way, but he says it unto yourselves. So that is the heed there to, to one's self. Um, to your own piety, your own spiritual walk. Your, take heed to your opinions. Take heed to your mode of life. It's the first du duty of a minister to be mindful of himself. Be mindful that he gets rest. Be mindful that he studies. Be mindful that he's in, in communication with his people. Be mindful of various things to take heed to, but along with to guard against. Realize that uh, we together, but here he was speaking to those gentlemen, they may have some uh, uh, not so common situations with everybody else when it comes to the devil's decision to make, uh, make things hard on them. Um, <clears throat> some of those things is a little bit of flattery that could come along to, to kind of pump up the head, amen? Well, that was good, that was great, that was wonderful. You're looking good. Have you lost weight? No, sorry. Um, sometimes it's ambition. Sometimes a preacher or these leaders can to, to fall into uh, despondency, a little bit of a, um, discouragement. Take heed. Take heed to yourself. If you're going to be the one to minister and give out, you've got to make sure you haven't given out, so to speak, so you get to, to be able to be prepared to take care of the flock that God has given you. And that's how he's saying this to, this, to these leaders there at the church. He knew that they had a great job, <clears throat> and he was thinking of that great church at, at, at Ephesus, and he's warning and encouraging, letting these men take heed to be careful for yourself. And then the flock as well. I get the, uh, the obvious easy illustration too is when you're in the airplane, they always talk about you getting the oxygen first and then help the person next to you because you need to be taken care of so that you can have the ability to help your child, wife, whatever the person might be there with you that is depending on your ability to get it to them. So take heed unto yourself. It's an important thing. There's various things we can speak about that as well. The things that might be more of a, of a dip for the preacher than it would be for others. <clears throat> but all of us, being human, we need prayer to take heed. Um, what are some things that you can do to take heed? Get enough sleep. <laughs> Get enough sleep, absolutely. But, you know, when I... Counseling with, with folks, we had counsel here a little bit after church today as well, and, and my, my counsel there was too, to, hey, you need to, you need to build up yourself. You need to stay away from some places that's going to pull you down. Stay in good and clean places. And I said, Harbor Baptist Church, I said, do you realize the name of that church, of this church that we're a part? I said, it's not called Out to Sea Baptist Church. I said, it's harbor. I said, it's, a, it's a, an inlet area that you can come in away from the waves and the sea and the rolling, uh, rolling waters to a place of rest and quietness. And, and you tie up along, you moor up next to the harbor. I said, it's a place of refuge. I said, you need to be, in, be close to a place of refuge. I reminded him I'm, I'm his friend. And I want to be here for him. We want here the doors to be open unto him. A number of you folks have said something like, hey, there's a young man here and he's crying. And he, Yeah, because in his, in his struggle, and I believe he's a Christian, he, uh, he knew where to come when he needed God. You know, I beg Harbor Baptist Church to always be that place, that we could be that one that place that will open, fling open double doors if we need to, to bring in people who need to get out of the cold, get out of the mess of this world, and the, the, uh, the tears and tearings of the devil, they can come and find a resting place, but they need to take heed, be mindful of the places where they go and be in the places where they ought to. Not only does um, 
Paul say to them themselves to take heed unto yourselves? But notice that verse says, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. <clears throat> Did it say to some of the flock? No, it said to all the flock. To all the flock. That which gathers here. And I, and I as a pastor, I look at those that gather here. Um, if you come here, and, th and this is where you come here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and you may or may not be a member, you know, I, I'm not so, uh, what do you call it, uh, stressed, maybe as I probably would have been before, about m getting people to move towards the, the blessing of truly becoming a member. <clears throat> But what I do know is those that come through these doors from this pastor as well as the previous pastor, and I trust the next pastor, will be just as open and caring and loving and treat you as the flock, no matter who walks through these doors. And so when it comes to feeding, I'm not just feeding members. I'm not just feeding those that give, whomever they may be. That's not the job of the pastor to know those particular things. But we feed those who walk through the door. Those who choose to come and have a seat. They need fed, loved, and cared for, and groomed, however you want to do, make the, make the picture to, to, to sheep and shepherds. It says, and to all the flock, take heed to all the flock. The, the church, the, the charge that was entrusted to them, take heed to that church, to instruct, to teach, to guide it, to guard from enemies, to make it their special object, to promote its welfare. This is for, this is the uh, practical side of the leadership men as well. That's our job to, to be careful and mindful of the flock. Know the state of the flock, the scripture says. Take heed to all the flock. You know, that's the rich ones that give and the poor ones that give. How about the rich ones that don't give? Yes, we love them too. And the poor ones that give. What are you want to look at? It doesn't matter. It says all the flock. We want to heed here. Amen? And to uh, be mindful there of each one, to be acquainted with Everyone has their unique character, and there's everyone in the church has their unique, can I use the word quirk? Because you know who's the king of quirks in this church? is me. And, and I thank you for your patience with me. And so we get along with each other because we look beyond the physical, and we look straight to the soul. And we see that person that Jesus loves and died for, and that Holy Spirit that is abiding in their life right now, that is whom we serve, amen? And uh, we just get to go along for the ride on that regard. So um, take heed, gentlemen, uh, take heed to yourself. Take heed to those about us that which have been given as we are given as overseers. It goes on and says it that way. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath given you, uh, given, made you to be overseers. It says to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Well, that leads us to the heating time. Goes on to what's the second thing? Feeding time. Feeding time. Um, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made, made you overseers for the purpose of feeding. For the, purchase, uh, for the purpose of feeding the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Please know that's more than just the food. That's more than spiritual food. That is a truly a, a governing, a, a nourishing. It's, it's securing, protecting, guarding, um, making sure needs are met. Be mindful of what's going on. And our church is blessed with, with widows, probably more, more on the uh, amount of, percentage of, here down in south in Florida where people come to retire than it would be in other churches. I've been in churches that are military minded, and it seems like the, the majority of the people that are there are coming and going, but their military, TDY, is in and out every four years. It kind of rotates around, and there's a few mamas and grandmas around that's there. Uh, when I was in a church in North Dakota uh, years ago, 
Um, I mean, there weren't even hardly any marriages because they come married. Um, and when it comes four years, they're gone, or three years, they're gone. And, and uh, we didn't have hardly any funerals. I mean, there wasn't anyone particularly old enough to, to die, so to speak. And we've had a few. I, I, I mean, truly, in the 20 years I was in, in North Dakota, uh, might have had, think about this, 20 years, two funerals. We've had two on one, one day a few years back here. And so it's just a different group of people. Military, and they're in and out. You get to have three years of investment, and they're gone. Again, it's a different deal, but you had to have a different kind of watch, a different kind of feeding, a different kind of a, a whole minister to them for sure. Um, Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter number 5. says, to the elders there, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money's sake, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage. Whose heritage is it? It's not my church. It's God's church. And we get to serve together, gentlemen, God's work, God's people, and we have the awesome privilege to work with each other but for the Lord and uh, uh, with these dear people. And so that feeding is, a, is an encompassing word, wide encompassing word. Because, because often, to go along with it, people can get tending to feed on the wrong things. And so we have to be, per we have to be careful that people don't get caught up feeding on things that could poison them, that could hurt them. And um, I've said this before, we're not here to try to, to cut off every known ability to, for you to reach out for the Word of God outside of this church. We know that's not a possibility, but it is our, our job to guard, our job to warn, our, our job to make sure that we know, or you know, the feeding holes that's worth eating and not going to get poisoned. So we need to be careful in the feeding time, to be mindful of what folks are, are feeding on. Go with me here, we'll see what Paul is talking about. Certainly there in chapter 20, and then verse number, um, I think I'll go to 29. Notice it says, for I know. He says, for I know, based on what he said just previously. He said, take heed and feed. Gives the, the whole reason, because of the, the blood and the purchase price that was given. This is of high value to God. For, he says in verse number 20, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. He says, I know this. It wasn't, this is going to be the chance, this is going to be an idea that could possibly happen. He, these people were in a, in a place of wickedness there in, in, in Ephesus. The goddess of Diana that was loved and reared uh, and, and, and admi ad, uh, admired and worshipped. There would be people that would come in and, and make havoc, be like a wolf in, or a dog or whatever you want to call it in the hen house said, these grievous wolves will enter in among you. And how does, this, how does he say that ending? How, is he going to be kind with the people? Is he going to be very gentlemanly? No, it, it looks to me like it says, not sparing the flock. He doesn't, the wolf doesn't care what, what gets accomplished as long as he gets fed and you get messed up. That's the job of a, of a wolf. It's a feared, ferocious thing. Did you, ever, did you ever hear the growl of a wolf? Have you ever been close enough to hear at night? It'll send shivers up your bloodstream, let me tell you. Verse 30 says, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He is exhorting the leadership men. When they go back to that flock, think of them as helpless in such a way. 
that they need guidance, they need encouragement, they need guarded because there is an enemy, because there and can be and should be a wolf because it was a promise in his mind, it's going to happen, it's very likely <clears throat> that a wolf could come in. But the further exhortation was, and they could be arisen from amongst your ranks. Even of them, those men that can get a wild eye, or maybe amongst the church people themselves that have come and been established and maybe not so established, but they're, here's the deal, they're feeding on other things. They're reading this or that on the internet, and, and they're reading another book by so-and-so who's revered in the world, but, you know, their doctrinal differences are, 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 are different than what we are over here, but, you know, that guy's a good speaker, and he's on the radio, and he's on TV, and he's got charisma, and I like to listen to him, and then all of a sudden, I'm finding things that are different than what I hear from the church here, and, and, and then you could imagine getting fed the wrong food poisoning your spirit, poisoning your mind, and then finally you having the courage enough to make a stand, make a statement, start talking to the neighbor and the other one at church. And then how, what, what happens to the church there? It says, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That's the leading of a coup of saying, you know what, preacher doesn't preach it the way it should be because I've heard it over here and this is right. Don't you believe it? Well, yeah, I guess so. And next thing you know, the strong-willed the strong -willed person that got a, got a little ired up a little bit tends to walk away bringing people with him, which is the pictures of what a wolf would do to the flock. <clears throat> and it can happen amongst the leadership, but also amongst the, the sheep that are gathered together. Look again at verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. If he's telling you, gentlemen, that there will be wolves, what should you do? Take heed. Take heed to yourself. Take heed to the church. Put the fences up. Put the gates up. Put, set the traps out. Do whatever you need to do to guard against the, the viciousness of a wolf that would enter in. Take heed. Listen. That's what we're going to move right into here next, here in a moment. It's called heeding time, feeding time. Then how about watching time? Watching time. <clears throat> Verse 30. Also... Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, because what was just said, because it could be one of the leadership, it could be once of the, some of the people, these wolves that would enter in. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. This was a serious subject to Paul. And he... He's taken a boat ride to Jerusalem to be bound and to finally get, be killed. And he stops, takes the time to have a, a, a powwow on the riverside, on, the, on, the, on the, the water side there at Miletus to encourage these men, to exhort these men because he knows the wolves. He knows that there's going to be an, an, an adverse effect of the devil upon God's people. And he says for them to take heed to yourselves. He says to them, be careful how you're feeding them, nurture them, guard them, protect them. So he says, so to watch and remember. What does it mean to be on a watch? I know we have some military men here. If you're on watch, I'm thinking that I should be able to sleep sweetly because I'm putting full trust in you standing guard. And when you're on watch, it's dark, it's nighttime, when wolves would like to make their prowl, and so you are listening, and you're looking for anything that should not be, things that you should not hear, you're taking heed to, things that you should not see, you're taking heed to, because you know those are resting confidently behind you. You stand as the watchman. It's an important thing for us to stand watch. Anyone ever been in a tornado? 
never been and not in one like, well, I don't think anyone has been up in a tornado that's still here today. But they use weather terms. And they'll say a weather, a tornado watch. <clears throat> what does that mean? And how does it mean and differ from a tornado warning? Who would rather be under a tornado watch or a tornado warning? I would rather be under the watch. <clears throat> but that still puts you on guard a bit, right? You know, if it's a warning, you take cover. And I've been in places when we were told, <laughs> get to the basement, get to the center room, do whatever. And, uh, and that's, that's a hairy feeling, it really is. But watches aren't as, an, uh, as scary, but it is enough that you're careful. So what I'm saying, we come to church, <laughs> if we want to use that, use that thought, we don't have our, our men standing guard at every door, you know, patting down everyone that walks in the door, thinking of a warning of someone's going to make their way in, they're going to cause us havoc. Well, Bob, you're going to come right through me. We had one of our ladies, uh, and I won't say the person's name, uh, she had said something about this person that was in church, and she had never known or met him before. And she has law enforcement background. And I said, you got your gun? She says, no, pastor, but I'll bring you next week. <laughs> I said, all right. You know, so anyway, it was just kind of funny. <clears throat> so we're not going to pat people down. We're not going to be at the door with the electrical, you know, whatever ear. But you know what? We're not under warning, per se. But we are under watch. And I told the lady as she left, I says, thank you for taking notice of a possible danger. Being on watch, amen, that was a blessing. And I filled in a little bit more of what I knew about the situation at the time. And uh, I said, we can kind of calm down. I'm, I'm not fearful that he's going to pull out any, any, uh, any hateful, hurtful things to happen. Um, <clears throat> anyway, therefore watch and remember by the space of three years. He warned, he pleaded, he preached, he taught day and night with tears. He had a passion for people to get good food, for the men to be raised up, to be able to stand guard. And then he gives this exhortation as he knows it's going to be his last. 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. This again is Paul, 2 Timothy, it's his last book he wrote. He's encouraging Timothy to watch thou. Watch thou in all things. We have our times, all right? We've got our heating time, our feeding time, our watching time. Now it's commending time. Commending time. Verse number 32 says, And now, brethren, after I have exhorted you to heed, to, to feed, and to watch, he says, now it's time for me. I can't be here anymore with you. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to trust entrust you to God. I'm going to give you over to God and the grace of God and the grace of his word. The scripture there says, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace both which is able to build you up. You know, the, the Word of God and the grace of that Word of God builds you up. The Word of God is what builds them up. I encourage you, men, we as a church, as a flock sheep, myself as a pastor, I, I want to be built up. I want to allow the Word of God and the grace that comes with that Word to build me, to strengthen me. And know that I am in perfect hands in God's hands. And he's encouraging these men to place, yes, you're under watch. Yes, you've got these marching orders. And it's all because of a of present danger. But rest peacefully, knowing that your God's got you. Know the grace that's going to be bestowed you through the word of God. It's there for you. And it's going to build you up. And not only that, it's going to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. There's great reward in doing your job. There's great reward to standing firm and standing straight with the word and the, and the truth of the scriptures and making sure we don't let folks eat out of the wrong pools. 
so that they will carry on and see other people saved. Their, their life will be changed and it'll be an evidence of the work and diligence of the leadership of that church and the growth of the people will have an inheritance. That's a blessing. Commending means to deliver with confidence. I see Rebecca back there someday. Some, now she's still there, but someday. <clears throat> it's going to be hard. But do you know what I'm doing right here? Don't whistle that one. Not yet. <laughs> someday, someone's going to say to me, who giveth this woman to be with <clears throat> that rotten man? <laughs> he better not be a rotten man. But I am going to, and I feel, I trust that Lord is going to be good enough to give him, her, a <coughs> wonderful man. And that I will be glad to, even though I'm kicking and screaming, I am going to be glad to commend her. That comes with recommendation, but it also in a putting of trust, putting her in trust to this gentleman. That's that commendation, that's commending. This is what Paul was saying to these gentlemen that he was putting them in the care of the Lord. The next verse there is 33, the, the expending, expending time. I know I had to kind of work with commending and all the other ings and such, but nonetheless, expending time. Expend means to use up, all right, to, to spend or to pay out. And that's the thought. Look with me to verse number 33. He exhorts them saying, hey, listen, gentlemen, I have coveted no man's silver, or gold or apparel. Money wasn't my motivator. What was my motivator? Motivator was the love of Jesus Christ that constrained me. It was the desire to see others built up in the faith, the desire to see souls saved and lives changed, like he changed me on the road to Damascus. I want that same experience and change in other people's lives like it was for me. I am a debtor to Christ, and he is saying, this is what motivates me, not money. Not your money. Yea, ye yourselves know, it says that in verse 34, that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. When we came as a team to Ephesus, he didn't come here looking for you to pay me he came there on his own work. He came there uh, entrusted by the Lord and, and filled by the Lord and cared for by the Lord and his own hands. He preaches and teaches there to do the work of your own hands. And he did. Now we can work with sometimes in Scripture there in Corinthians and Galatians. We know that he would probably would like to have been more burdensome to the people for them to get more skin in the game. And there's, that's all good for missions conference and everything too. And that's a whole portion of that. But the idea was to hear to these men, hey, we're not in it here for the money. We're not here for the gain that we're going to get or the, the, uh, the praise of men. We're here for the duty of these other folks. <clears throat> it says... Yea, yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things. How that so laboring, that kind of laboring, the things that I'm doing for myself to enable me and by God's grace and help, and he had a talent that he used. What was his talent? Tent making. All right. And so he had some things he could do on the road. He had his, what, side gig, amen, as they would call it today. He says, how that so laboring, ye ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how, it's, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Can you see the heart in that message there? Remember, it's not what we're getting from. You know, please, don't, don't be a blessing to a widow and get their groceries and bring it to them and then stand at the door going like this. You didn't do it for money. None of these things are, are for those, those types of gains. <clears throat> and sometimes it might take money as we have offered and, and can from the church to be a blessing to peoples within our church. But what we're saying here too is don't be afraid of investing yourself 
If, if you need to pull out a $20 bill to help out in a situation, well, you pull out a $20 bill and help out in a situation. Don't say, hey, pastor, can I get 20 bucks so that I can go help so-and-so? Well, yeah, I will. I'd be glad to. And as a church group, we would be happy to because this is what giving and our benevolence fund and all that kind of stuff that we have, yes, it's there. But you know, I'm, what he's saying is, to, he says, hey, I worked. You work. Be mindful that, hey, you guys, you can, you can handle some of this on your own. No, some can, some can't. We all know that. Part. And please don't put yourself in a, in a position that's going to be difficult for you. Sure. But the mind is, we're in it for the glory of God, not the glory of man. And, and the, the praise of man, he really, he really spent and was lavish. No, 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 that's, that's not it. <clears throat> so it's an expending time. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Guys, not just our leadership men, but... Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the need, it comes to bearing one another's burdens. You know, when we bear one another's burdens, that not, doesn't necessarily mean the pastor. doesn't necessarily mean the deacon or the trustee. That means one another. Bear ye one another's burdens. When you have ability, you, you can and you do, God's going to bless you. Paul had his heart saying, I will very gladly spend of myself spend of my time, my treasure, my talent, my, my, my tears. Now, sometimes people just want to hear and have an ear. They want to unload. They want to have a, a shoulder to cry on. That You can't pay for that, ladies and gentlemen. But that's what you can do, and it's free of charge. It just takes a little bit of your compassion, a little bit of your time. And you can be an incredible minister to somebody if you'll be willing to be spent. The last one here tonight. We had a heating time and a feeding time, a watching time, a commending time. Don't flip the switch, on it, Chris. An expending time. Anybody know what the last one's going to be? It's a praying time. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's for sure. I just didn't think of that one. Thanks, Pastor. Appreciate that. It's, it's, it's in there, isn't it? It's an emotional time. You know, don't be afraid to be emotional with people. I think you probably know that I can get a little emotional every now and again. And there's nothing wrong with controlled <laughs> emotion. My uh, mother-in-law says, you know me, Mike. I'm just, I already got the room cleaned out. And I'm just working and working and trying to get things squared away. And I said, yeah, Mom, I know. That's how you were last time with Dad, Dad Graves. And she buries herself in her work. And she says, but you know, there's sometimes I just need to go find a hole and crawl up in it and cry. And I said, yes, you do that, Mom. Go do it. And she says, yeah, I know you have. I said, absolutely. And I still do. There's times you just need to go cry. Let it out. Just cry it out. And that's what these folks, they knew they would not see each other again. This side of heaven. And so they all wept sore, verse 37. And they fell on Paul's neck. And they kissed him. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. That's how that ended. Now, if you're like me, I'm standing at the shore until I can't see the boat anymore. Yeah? Because that's the connection, that's the humanity that we have. Don't be afraid to get emotional, gentlemen. That shows your heart, shows your love, that you're real. And that you're not just some kind of superhuman that has no, no effect at all. Emotions are a good thing. Let it, let it mold yourself with people to cry with them.
to be able to laugh when they laugh and to weep when they weep. Amen. To walk a second mile when they only ask and need one mile, be willing to go too. You know, we could preach all <laughs> continuously about this particular thing. But can you see Paul's heart there in the beginning? As, as he teaches the, the, the commitments that are necessary. And without those set commitments that, that they would truly love with all their heart and be committed to God. Can you help me with the other three were? That committed to his word, committed to the people, and committed to lost souls. When he knew that those gentlemen gathered at that seashore would commit those things, it was much easier to say, hey, now listen, because of the importance of these things, you've got to be a guard. You've got to be on watch. You've got to protect the sheep, feed the sheep, and uh, con uh, control so as you can physically and, and, and humanly. Uh, be mindful of things that could be pitfalls and be, be watchful for them. It doesn't mean you act and be the Holy Spirit and step into people and, and step into their face and you, you say things that would be uh, harmful and such. No, we, we do things with, with the moving of the Lord, taking our steps prayerfully and mindfully because we want to live peaceably one with another. You know, we, we are different. We're all different, and some things make ourselves tick one way or the other. And your way isn't always the right way. My way definitely is not always the right way. But guess whose way is always the right way? God. The Scripture. So that's why if we commit ourselves to God, commit ourselves to the Word, and we commit ourselves to the people, and especially to lost folk, as we saw the heart here, we then can learn to spend ourselves, And we can have emotional times that we can run the roller coaster of the high, exciting times, but be in the depths with one another and be able to pray one with another and cry one with another. The meeting at Melita. What a meeting it was. Well, I'd have loved to have been there to listen in on that one. But uh, God gave us his word to instruct us. We are actually, and we're at that meeting today by looking at the scriptures tonight. God help us as gentlemen, as church, our church body, that we will take these exhortations, receiving and giving, so that we might serve him in a greater way for God's glory. Our Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for the heart of your word as expressed through the, your, your preacher, your missionary, your author, who penned the very words of God in the book of Acts. I know it was Luke that wrote this book, but we know he was writing of the Acts and the workings of Paul. So God, I pray that you would bless us tonight, encourage us, as we have a, a hymn of invitation, as we meditate, we, we, we think of the Lord, think of these things. If there's any way we could and should pray in some fashion to, to uh, answer any movings of the Spirit of God in our lives, may it be done at this particular time. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Josh, would you come and we'll just sing a song together tonight. And sing it as unto the Lord, if you would. Thank you. Let's all stand, please, would you? Please.